Chapter One of Windsor Castle, Book Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Windsor Castle, Book Five, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Chapter One: How the Earl of Surrey and the Fair Geraldine met in King James's bower in the moat, and how they were surprised by the Duke of Richmond. In order to preserve unbroken the chain of events with which the last book of this chronicle concluded, it was deemed expedient to disturb the unity of time so far as it related to some of the less important characters, and it will now be necessary, therefore, to return to the middle of June, when the Earl of Surrey's term of captivity was drawing to a close. As the best means of conquering the anxiety produced by the vision exhibited to him by Hearn, increased as it was by the loss of the relic he had sustained at the same time, the Earl had devoted himself to incessant study, and for a whole month he remained within his chamber. The consequence of his unremitting application was that though he succeeded in his design and completely regained his tranquillity, his strength gave way under the effort, and he was confined for some days to his couch by a low fever. As soon as he was sufficiently recovered to venture forth, he mounted to the summit of the round tower in the hope that a walk round its breezy battlements might conduce to his restoration to health. The day was bright and beautiful, and a gentle wind was stirring. And as Surrey felt the breath of heaven upon his cheek, and gazed upon the glorious prospect before him, he wondered that his imprisonment had not driven him mad. Everything around him, indeed, was calculated to make the sense of captivity painful. The broad and beautiful meads stretching out beneath him seemed to invite a ramble over them. The silver river courted a plunge into its waves. The woods an hour's retirement into their shady recesses. The bells of Eton College rang out merrily, but their sound saddened rather than elated him. The road between Eton and Windsor, then marked by straggling cottages with gardens between them, with here and there a dwelling of a better kind, was thronged with herds of cattle and their drivers, for a fair was held that day in the town of Windsor, to which they were hastening. Then there were the country maidens and youthful hinds in their holiday apparel, trooping towards the bridge. Booths were erected, near which, in the Brockus Meads, the rustic sports of wrestling, running, and casting the bar were going forward, while numbers of boats shot to and fro upon the river, and strains of music proceeded from a large gilt barge moored to its banks. Nearer, and in the broad green plain lying beneath the north terrace, were a company of archers shooting at the butts. But these sights, instead of affording pleasure to Surrey, only sharpened the anguish of his feelings by the contrast they offered to his present position. To distract his thoughts, he quitted the near view and let his eye run along the edge of the horizon until it rested upon a small speck which he knew to be the lofty spire of St. Paul's Cathedral. If, as he supposed, the fair Geraldine was in attendance upon Anne Boleyn at the Palace of Bridewell, she must be under the shadow of this very spire. And the supposition, whether correct or not, produced such quick and stifling emotions that the tears rushed to his eyes. Ashamed of his weakness, he turned to the other side of the tower, and bent his gaze upon the woody heights of the great park. These recalled Hearn the Hunter, and burning with resentment at the tricks practised upon him by the demon, he determined that the first use he would make of his liberty should be to seek out, and if possible, effect the capture of this mysterious being. 
some of the strange encounters between Herne and the king had been related to him by the officer on guard at the Norman Tower, but these only served as stimulants to the adventure. After a couple of hours thus passed on the keep, he descended refreshed and invigorated. The next day he was there again, and the day after that. When feeling that his restoration was well nigh complete, he requested permission to pass the following evening in the dry moat of the dungeon, and this was readily accorded him. Covered with green sod, and shaded by many tall trees growing out of the side of the artificial mound on which the keep was built, the foss offered all the advantages of a garden to the prisoners who were allowed to take exercise within it. Here, as has been mentioned, King James I of Scotland first beheld, from the battlements above, the lovely Jane Beaufort take her solitary walk, and by his looks and gestures contrived to make her sensible of the passion with which she inspired him. And here at last, in an arbour, which for the sake of the old and delightful legend connected with it, was kept up at the time of this chronicle, and then bore the name of the royal poet, they had secretly met, and interchanged their vows of affection. Familiar with the story, familiar also with the poetic strains to which the monarch's passion gave birth, Surrey could not help comparing his own fate with that of the illustrious captive who had visited the spot before him. Full of such thoughts, he pensively tracked the narrow path winding between the grassy banks of the foss, now casting up his eyes to the keep, now looking towards the arbour, and wishing that he had been favoured with such visitings as lightened the captivity of the Scottish king. At last he sought the bower, a charming little nest of green leaves and roses, sheltering a bench which seemed only contrived for lovers. And taking out his tablets, began to trace within them some stanzas of that exquisite poem which has linked his name for ever with the round tower. Thus occupied, the time stole on insensibly, and he was not aware that he had overstayed the limits allowed him, till he was aroused by the voice of the officer, who came to summon him back to his prison. "'You'll be removed to your old lodging in the round tower to-morrow night, my lord,' said the officer. "'For what reason?' demanded the earl, as he followed his conductor up the steep side of the mound. But receiving no reply, he did not renew the inquiry. Entering a door in the covered way at the head of the flight of steps communicating with the Norman Tower, they descended them in silence. Just as they reached the foot of this long staircase, the earl chanced to cast back his eyes, and to his inexpressible astonishment perceived on the landing at the head of the steps, and just before the piece of ordnance commanding the ascent, the figure of Herne the Hunter. Before he could utter an exclamation, the figure retreated through the adjoining archway. Telling the officer what he had seen, Surrey would fain have gone in quest of the fiendish spy, but the other would not permit him, and affecting to treat the matter as a mere creation of fancy, he hurried the earl to his chamber in the curfew tower. The next day Surrey was removed betimes to the round tower and the cause of the transfer was soon explained by the discharge of ordnance, the braying of trumpets, and the rolling of drums, announcing the arrival of the king. From the mystery observed towards him, Surrey was led to the conclusion that the fair Geraldine accompanied the royal party. But he in vain sought to satisfy himself of the truth of the surmise by examining through the deep embrasure of his window, the cavalcade that soon afterwards entered the upper quadrangle. Amid the throng of beautiful dames surrounding Anne Boleyn, he could not be certain that he detected the fair Geraldine, but he readily distinguished the Duke of Richmond among the nobles, and the sight 
awakened a pang of bitter jealousy in his breast. The day wore away slowly, for he could not fix his attention upon his books. Neither was he allowed to go forth upon the battlements of the tower. In the evening, however, the officer informed him he might take exercise within the dry moat if he was so inclined, and he gladly availed himself of the permission. After pacing to and fro along the walk for a short time, he entered the arbour, and was about to throw himself upon the bench, when he observed a slip of paper lying upon it. He took it up, and found a few lines traced upon it in hurried characters. They ran thus. The fair Geraldine arrived this morning in the castle. If the Earl of Surrey desires to meet her, he will find her within this arbour at midnight. This billet was read and re-read by the young Earl, with feelings of indescribable transport. But a little reflection damped his ardour, and made him fear it might be a device to ensnare him. There was no certainty that the note proceeded in any way from the fair Geraldine, nor could he even be sure that she was in the castle. Still, despite these misgivings, the attraction was too powerful to be resisted, and he turned over the means of getting out of his chamber. But the scheme seemed wholly impracticable. The window was at a considerable height above the ramparts of the keep and even if he could reach them and escape the notice of the sentinels, he should have to make a second descent into the fosse. And supposing all this accomplished, how was he to return? The impossibility of answering this latter mental interrogation compelled him to give up all idea of the attempt. On returning to his prison chamber, he stationed himself at the embrasure overlooking the ramparts, and listened to the regular tread of the sentinel below, half resolved, be the consequences what they might, to descend. As the appointed time approached, his anxiety became almost intolerable, and quitting the window, he began to pace hurriedly to and fro within the chamber, which, as has been previously observed, partook of the circular form of the keep and was supported in certain places by great wooden pillars and cross-beams. But instead of dissipating his agitation, his rapid movements seemed rather to increase it, and at last, wrought to a pitch of uncontrollable excitement, he cried aloud, "'If the fiend were to present himself now, and offer to lead me to her, I would follow him.' Scarcely were the words uttered than a hollow laugh broke from the farther end of the chamber, and a deep voice exclaimed, "'I am ready to take you to her.' "'I need not ask who addresses me,' said Surrey, after a pause, and straining his eyes to distinguish the figure of the speaker in the gloom. "'I will tell you who I am,' rejoined the other. "'I am he.' who visited you once before, who showed you a vision of the fair Geraldine, and carried off your vaunted relic, ho, ho! Avoid thee, false fiend, rejoined Surrey. Thou temptest me now in vain. You have summoned me, returned Hearn, and I will not be dismissed. I am ready to convey you to your mistress, who awaits you in King James's bower, and marvels at your tardiness. "'And with what design dost thou offer me this service?' demanded Surrey. "'It will be time enough to put that question when I make any condition,' replied Hearn. "'Enough. I am willing to aid you. Will you go?' "'Lead on,' replied Surrey, marching towards him. Suddenly, Hearn drew a lantern from beneath the cloak in which he was wrapped, and threw its light on a trap-door lying open at his feet. Descend! Surrey hesitated a moment, and then plunged down the steps. In another instant the demon followed. 
Some hidden machinery was then set in motion, and the trap-door returned to its place. At length Surrey arrived at a narrow passage, which appeared to correspond in form with the bulwarks of the keep. Here Hearn passed him, and taking the lead, hurried along the gallery and descended another flight of steps, which brought them to a large vault, apparently built in the foundation of the tower. Before the earl had time to gaze round this chamber, the demon masked the lantern, and taking his hand drew him through a narrow passage, terminated by a small iron door, which flew open at a touch, and they emerged among the bushes clothing the side of the mound. "'You can now proceed without my aid,' said Hearn. "'But take care not to expose yourself to the sentinels.' Keeping under the shade of the trees, for the moon was shining brightly, Surrey hastened towards the arbour, and as he entered it, to his inexpressible delight, found that he had not been deceived, but that the fair Geraldine was indeed there. "'How did you contrive this meeting?' she cried, after their first greetings had passed. "'And how did you learn I was in the castle?' for the strictest instructions were given that the tidings should not reach you. The only response made by Surrey was to press her lily hand devotedly to his lips. "'I should not have ventured hither,' pursued the fair Geraldine, "'unless you had sent me the relic as a token. I knew you would never part with it, and I therefore felt sure there was no deception.' "'But how did you get here?' inquired Surrey. "'Your messenger provided a rope-ladder, by which I descended into the moat,' she replied. Surrey was stupefied. "'You seem astonished at my resolution,' she continued. "'And, indeed, I am surprised at it myself. But I could not overcome my desire to see you, especially as this meeting may be our last. The King, through the Lady Anne Boleyn, has positively enjoined me to think no more of you, and has given your father, the Duke of Norfolk, to understand that your marriage without the royal assent will be attended by the loss of all the favour he now enjoys. "'And think you I will submit to such tyranny?' cried Surrey. "'Alas!' replied the fair Geraldine, in a mournful tone, "'I feel we shall never be united.' This conviction, which has lately forced itself upon my mind, has not made me love you less, though it has in some degrees altered my feelings towards you. "'But I may be able to move the King,' cried Surrey. "'I have some claim besides, that of kindred on the Lady Anne Boleyn, and she will obtain his consent.' "'Do not trust to her,' replied the fair Geraldine. You may have rendered her an important service, but be not too sure of a return. No, Surrey, I here release you from the troth you plighted to me in the cloisters. I will not be released from it, cried the earl hastily. Neither will I release you. I hold the pledge as sacred and as binding as if we had been affianced together before heaven. "'For your own sake, do not say so, my dear lord,' rejoined the fair Geraldine. "'I beseech you, do not. "'That your heart is bound to me now, I well believe. "'That you could become inconstant, I will not permit myself to suppose. "'But your youth forbids an union between us for many years. "'And if during that time you should behold some fairer face than mine, or should meet some heart you may conceive more loving, though that can hardly be, I would not have a hasty vow restrain you. Be free, then, free at least for three years, and if at the end of that time your affections are still unchanged, I am willing you should bind yourself to me for ever. I cannot act with equal generosity to you, 
rejoined Surrey, in a tone of deep disappointment. "'I would sooner part with life than relinquish the pledge I have received from you. "'But I am content that my constancy should be put to the test you propose. "'During the long term of my probation, I will shrink from no trial of faith. "'Throughout Europe I will proclaim your beauty in the lists, "'and will maintain its supremacy against all comers.' "'But, oh, sweet Geraldine, since we have met in this spot, "'hallowed by the loves of James of Scotland and Jane Beaufort, "'let us here renew our vows of eternal constancy, "'and agree to meet again at the time you have appointed, "'with hearts as warm and loving as those we bring together now.' "'And as he spoke, he drew her towards him, and imprinted a passionate kiss on her lips. "'Let that ratify the pledge,' he said. "'Ho, ho, ho!' laughed a deep voice without. "'What was that?' demanded the fair Geraldine, in a tone of alarm. "'You have the relic, have you not?' inquired the Earl, in a low tone. "'No!' she replied. Your messenger merely showed it to me. But why do you ask? Ah, I understand. The fiendish laughter that just now sounded in my ears proceeded from Hearn the Hunter, replied Surrey in a whisper. But fear nothing. I will defend you with my life. Ah, a cursed chance! I have no weapon! "'None would avail against him,' murmured the fair Geraldine. "'Lead me forth. I shall die if I stay here.' Supporting her in his arms, Surrey complied. But they had scarcely gained the entrance of the arbour when a tall figure stood before them. It was the Duke of Richmond. A gleam of moonlight penetrating through the leaves fell upon the group, and rendered them distinctly visible to each other. "'So!' exclaimed the Duke, after regarding the pair in silence for a moment. "'I have not been misinformed. You have contrived a meeting here.' "'Richmond,' said Surrey sternly, "'we once were dear and loving friends, and we are still honourable foes. I know that I am safe with you, I know you will breathe no word about this meeting, either to the fair Geraldine's prejudice or mine. "'You judge me rightly, my lord,' replied the Duke, in a tone of equal sternness. "'I have no thought of betraying you, though by a word to my royal father I could prevent all chance of future rivalry on your part. I shall, however, demand a strict account from you on liberation. Your grace acts as beseems a loyal gentleman, replied Surrey. Hereafter I will not fail to account to you for my conduct in any way you please. Oh, let me interpose between you, my lords, cried the fair Geraldine, to prevent the disastrous consequences of this quarrel. I have already told your grace I cannot love you, and that my heart is devoted to the Earl of Surrey. Let me appeal to your noble nature, to your generosity, not to persist in a hopeless suit. You have conquered, madam, said the Duke, after a pause. I have been to blame in this matter, but I will make amends for my error. Surrey? I relinquish her to you. My friend! exclaimed the earl, casting himself into the duke's arms. I will now endeavour to heal the wounds I have unwittingly occasioned, said the fair Geraldine. I am surprised your grace should be insensible to attractions so far superior to mine as those of the Lady Mary Howard. "'The Lady Mary is very beautiful, I confess,' said the Duke, "'and if you had not been in the way, 
I should assuredly have been her captive. "'I ought not to betray the secret, perhaps,' hesitated the fair Geraldine, "'but gratitude prompts me to do so. "'The lady is not so blind to your grace's merits as I have been.' "'Indeed!' exclaimed the duke. "'If it be so, Surrey, we may yet be brothers as well as friends.' "'And that it is so, I can avouch, Richmond,' rejoined the Earl. "'For I am in my sister's secret, as well as the fair Geraldine. "'But now that this explanation has taken place, "'I must entreat your grace to conduct the fair Geraldine back to her lodgings, "'while I regain, the best way I can, my chamber in the round tower.' "'I marvel how you escaped from it,' said Richmond but I suppose it was by the connivance of the officer. He who set me free, who brought the fair Geraldine hither, and who, I suspect, acquainted you with our meeting, was no other than Herne the Hunter, replied Surrey. "'You amaze me!' exclaimed the Duke. "'It was indeed a tall dark man, muffled in a cloak, who informed me that you were to meet at midnight in King James's bower in the moat, and I therefore came to surprise you. "'Your informant was Hearn,' replied Surrey. "'Right!' exclaimed the demon, stepping from behind a tree where he had hitherto remained concealed. "'It was I, I, Hearn the Hunter.' and I contrived the meeting in anticipation of a far different result from that which has ensued. But I now tell you, my lord of Surrey, that it is idle to indulge a passion for the fair Geraldine. You will never wed her. "'False fiend! Thou liest!' cried Surrey. "'Time will show,' replied Hearn. "'I repeat, you will wed another. And more, I tell you, you are blinder than Richmond has shown himself, for the most illustrious damsel in the kingdom has regarded you with eyes of affection, and yet you have not perceived it. The Princess Mary? demanded Richmond. I, the Princess Mary, repeated Hearn. How say you now, my lord? Will you let ambition usurp the place of love? No, replied Surrey, but I will hold no further converse with thee. Thou wouldst tempt to perdition. Hence, fiend! Unless you trust yourself to my guidance, you will never reach your chamber, rejoined Hearn with a mocking laugh. The iron door in the mound cannot be opened on this side and you well know what the consequence of a discovery will be. Come, or I leave you to your fate. And he moved down the path on the right. Go with him, Surrey, cried Richmond. Pressing the fair Geraldine to his breast, the Earl committed her to the charge of his friend, and tearing himself away, followed the steps of the demon. He had not proceeded far when he heard his name pronounced by a voice issuing from the tree above him. Looking up, he saw Hearn in one of the topmost branches, and at a sign instantly climbed up to him. The thick foliage screened them from observation, and Surrey concluded his guide was awaiting the disappearance of the sentinel, who was at that moment approaching the tree. But such, apparently, was not the other's intentions, for the man had scarcely passed than Hearn sprang upon the ramparts, and the poor fellow, turning at the sound, was almost scared out of his senses at the sight of the dreaded fiend. Dropping his halbert, he fell upon his face with a stifled cry. Hearn then motioned Surrey to descend 
and they marched together quickly to a low door opening into the keep. Passing through it, and ascending a flight of steps, they stood upon the landing at the top of the staircase communicating with the Norman Tower and adjoining the entrance to Surrey's chamber. Apparently familiar with the spot, Hearn took down a large key from a nail in the wall against which it hung, and unlocked the door. "'Enter,' he said to Surrey, "'and do not forget the debt you owe to Hearn the Hunter.' And as the Earl stepped into the chamber, the door was locked behind him. End of chapter 1